second one is to have disincentives or discourage people from taking their cars. So we have those two sets of policies. We are under pressure now to do something about property, about parking, and so on. However, we tend to neglect then the first part, make public transport better. Because if we uh, provide a disincentive, make it income less convenient for people to use cars, they will complain and mobility will decrease. But if we dis provide disincentives, but provide better transit, then there is no excuse. Then we can exert that policy. And this is a theoretical explanation, but it's a real world also. Really, I give you cities which never understood this and they are in a hopeless situation, or cities which have understood and continuously followed those policies and they are vastly better in what I call more livable cities than the others which have no clear policies and no clear knowledge. My today's lecture will not cover all those questions. It will focus on public transportation. On public transportation and primarily on so-called surface transit, or I will give a review of different modes. And uh, maybe if the time allows, I will get to some remarks about metros also. Um, we have, we have uh, transit modes, or VD, of Chesternal Transporta. Um, and we define them by three basic characteristics. One is the right of way, that's a prioritet proyesda. And that C means it's a streets with general traffic. It's Tverskaya and there are some buses and trolley buses. They are right on that, on that policy, categoria C. C. Then we have separation of transit vehicles, but not complete. Most typical one is when tramway goes on a separate path and has crossings and pedestrians can cross. But most of the way, it is free from traffic and can bypass traffic. That is categoria B. That is vastly better than category C because we get that public transport is independent of congestion. Finally, if we have heavy volumes of tra traffic on public transport, that means if our trolley buses are going one after the other very slowly, we see we have to have higher capacity mode, very high capacity mode, and that is then uh, mode which is fully separated, totally independent of any influence. And that mode is the metro, right? And regional rail, railway. So those are the highest mode. Um, we also find that to define different modes, we have different technologia, and basically we have road vehicles steered by the driver, or we have rail vehicles, which are in this case, electric and guided by the rails. There are big differences among these modes, and uh, we use them, therefore, in different ways. Some are local, every bus or train stops at every stop, and some is express and we have some short lines in the city. We have obviously a regular traffic lines in the city, and we have regional lines, which are mostly railways, sometimes buses, and so on. <coughs> These modes differ greatly in their uh, operation of characteristics and performance. 
and they are major categories are the autobus it is BRT which is really autobus with right of way B separate partially separated then we have tramway which is on the streets or partially separated LRT light rail transit or Lehki metro which is nearly all B and sometimes even A so it is largely separated and has great advantages over tramway then we have automated guided transit those modes are used extensively in airports as local distributors but there are some some increasing number in different cities fully automated and then we get to our metro which is the basic mode of transportation in very large cities if you are talking about cities with million and more people um, uh, metro usually is very important or most important cities which have five million or eight million and do not have metro have terrible problems they cannot have good transportation um, are metros used very much when the automobile became very much used in cities some people said well now people have cars public transport would not be so important that was in 1950-60 what happened then was that transportation experts and planners saw that they must provide a much higher quality transit not only buses so that really since the automobile came metros became much more important and we had in the 1950s 20 cities in the world with metros now how many do we have over 120 so that's used extensively and then we have Prigorodny Poyez which also in very large cities is used more and more and cities like Paris, London, New York, Chicago and Moscow have that extensive network some of them however have most systematically planned the entire networks and have uh, uh, regional railways as a transit system with regular frequent service uh, regular provides regular service for the region which metro and other modes provide for the city um, I did not mention some, I, I'm keeping for the end, who, who uh, did the best planning and best, has the best systems of regional rail are the German cities and Japanese cities. Japan, in, in, in and around Tokyo, carries more people on metro and regional rail than Moscow, Paris, New York, and, and, and London together. So it's remarkable what they're doing. In your case, and I will turn later more toward Moscow, um, you have fortunately many railway lines in the region, but they're not well integrated and not well really, um, not modernized to the standards which they should be. So now the plans are to utilize many of those lines, and I would expect that in the next 10 or 20 years, your railways will be much more integrated and provide better services complementing the metro now when we look at these urban modes basically in the city we have two uh, very common categories one is the bus which is transit in every city from small city to large city all buses buses uh, have lowest expense 
their investment is very low uh, because there is no infrastructure to build, just the vehicle and organization services. But it's quality of service, that means the speed, reliability, and capacity, and so on, is also rather low. The other extreme is the metro, which has high capacity, high reliability, speed, safety, it's absolutely ultimate in quality of service, but it requires very high investment. What happened in many cities when they began to build metro systems was that some theory appeared, so-called theory of two modes. Now we have metro and we have the bus and we should not complicate with other modes. That theory has led to that extreme for example, in London, you have the underground, which is large, but it's not big enough for London. And I'll tell you why. You have buses. Buses carry more passengers than rail, which is paradoxical for such a large city. And they had tramway and, and trolley bus, and they abandoned them. So they have only one and the other. Now, recently, they built two very modern light rail transit lines. So they are reversing and uh, working on more rail systems. Um, Hamburg dropped to uh, metro and buses. Many other cities had big debate about that. And basically, most of them decided that in spite of having the metro, just supplementing by bus on the streets is not enough. That is in Vienna, that is in Munich, that is in San Francisco, that is in Boston, and so on. Interestingly, it seems that it is really simpler to have only two different modes. It's more efficient to have so-called economy of scale, with large volumes on rail and on the bus. However, in real world, some of the cities with most, with the best public transportation have very diverse modes of transportation. San Francisco uses about seven different modes, from regional rail to light rail to bus, to trolley bus, very extensive trolley bus, to cable car and so on. Boston has several modes so that uh, Vienna has several modes, so that um, this theory that you should simplify the system into metro and bus is not valid. Um, be, you see, what the problem is, metro provides the best service, but it is expensive to build and it's large scale. So in very few cities, you have really great area coverage by the metro. In Paris, it's very good coverage. But in, um, even in Moscow, with your very large system, there are many places from which you have to walk quite a bit to get to the metro, and maybe then aside also. So that uh, metro is very often not sufficient to provide service. Why not build many more tunnels? Well, it is a question of economics and physical things. You cannot easily build a very dense network of metro. So many cities, and some smaller cities, cannot afford metro. Uh, your, your country, I, I'm afraid, still has a simple rule which has some rationale, but it's a little bit too crude as it is used. When the city reaches one million, then the government from Moscow, federal government, gives the money for the metro. Now, a city which needs one line of metro, it's a nice line, but one line doesn't solve transportation. 
Then they go and build a line, sometimes with all kinds of marble and escalators. I mean, really beautiful, because now we are a metro city like Moscow, right? But they neglect all trolley buses, buses, and tramways. So that's a, that's a problem which many cities have. So to summarize, many cities really, as they are growing, they need something much better than buses can offer on the streets. But they want something that requires less investment than a metro. So we have a big hole here. And that was in many cities. These cities with metro and bus only have a whole, do not have sufficient coverage and sufficient services. So in the last 30, 40 years, we have come back to, uh, to develop also these so-called medium capacity modes. And those are improved buses, light rail, the most common in this category and ADT, this automated guided transit. So there has been a lot of development in that area, and I want to give you a review where those most stand, uh, and on that basis, we can then see where Moscow stands, and is your medium capacity uh, category uh, efficient, or what should you do with it? Because, of course, you are building more metro lines, but uh, if you neglect this, you do have a big problem. So let me just define these three modes in the middle. The buses, so-called bus rapid transit, there have been many attempts with buses to make them more attractive, because bus is as slow as the, uh, slower than the traffic. So it's a fairly slow and unreliable mode on the street. It's on right way C. Um, then came the idea, why not uh, separate buses from other traffic? And uh, what tramways used to have separate way for their tracks, independent of traffic, and then the campaigns against tramways said, no, we should pave that so we can use it for buses and for other cars and so on. They then degraded transit from having right-of-way B to right-of-way A. This was a drastic mistake, and, uh, and it resulted in huge losses of passengers. As cities changed from tramways to buses in the United States, about 30% of riders were lost. Um, now, after 30, 40 years, people see that you cannot attract people to buses which are congested in other traffic. So now they said, why don't we have, we're, we're reinventing right away B for transit right? at a much higher cost because of the mistake we made when we lost it. So the buses, there were attempts to make buses which are guided from, uh, from lateral boards so they can be guided in that way, but that technology did not succeed very much. There are three, four cities in the world which are using it. Express lines, bus lanes were introduced and so on. Uh, and then came a movement of this BRT, which is very energetic movement to make physically separated lanes, and in most cases, high platforms and high floors so that people can board in the light without steps, and people pay tickets before they get to the buses. So there is an attempt that buses take as many characteristics of rail as they can. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you in a minute how successful it is, what are the positive and what are negative sides of that. So um, the buses 
bus mode has a range of vehicles. One is smaller vehicles, sometimes mini buses, or so-called medium-sized buses. And they very often come with, the, uh, with many companies, many operators. And they come and get, uh, in, in some countries, they get approval to compete with transit and to provide a, a, a additional services. Or, in some developing countries, they don't have any public transport that is organized. It's all mini buses and midi buses. In Lima, Peru, five million passenger travel trips per day, 10% of that is operated by public agency and regular buses, schedules, lines, and so on. Four and a half million are just mini buses and jitneys and so on, with extremely unreliable service, unsafe service, and so on. This was in Bogota, and Bogota, until recently, really didn't have even regular transit. The city is going toward eight or nine million people. So now they have one BRT that operates very well, and they are planning also metro. So, in developing countries, this is very common uh, mode of transportation. In developed countries, uh, the, this mode does not offer quality of service that meets our standards, uh, and uh, therefore, there is much less of that so-called paratransit. I can mention now, along the way, that I was quite shocked when I heard that your country, which had very good, very well organized public transport, bus, trolley, bus, tramway, in virtually all cities, at once not only allowed to reorganize transit agencies to increase efficiency and so on, they open it up completely to a so-called free market. That is a major step backward. And that means you really get uh, a lot more minibuses immediately, but they are unreliable and they, uh, they are not a coordinated service which we need in cities. They are therefore successful in developing countries, but your cities like Irkutsk and many others should keep better services than this uh, uh, unlimited and uncontrolled, unregulated uh, paratransit. I could give you many more examples. Mexico City, which had a huge system of subways and some tramways and many buses uh, under political pressures of international bank and so on, they opened up to many buses. They got uh, mini buses everywhere. I asked them, how many do you have? We estimate between 26 and 34,000. It's a system that is not a system that is not controlled, that you cannot plan anything with. Now, after several years, they've had enough of mini buses, they are returning more to better regulation and coordination. Yeah, this is <laughs> very common. They break down, the quality is very low. Improvements of buses then started quite some time ago because, as I said, we noticed that on one street, buses are going every three minutes and buses carry maybe two, three thousand passengers per hour and uh, the cars that go there carry maybe 800 or 500 passengers. So, uh, Cities in Europe, in New York, in Baltimore, and so on, introduced bus lanes. And bus lanes have been a step forward. Um, they're logical. They can be successful, but they depend on the enforcement. They're continuously dependent on that. 
and they are sometimes even subject to political decisions. Sometimes the city council people say, oh, we should allow a right turn on that street and the bus lane should, should be compromised and so on. Um, so the danger of lanes is, uh, is uh, its permanence and reliability and so on. So I would encourage uh, bus lanes wherever it's possible. The bus frequency does have to be reasonably high. If you have one bus every five minutes, you cannot justify that, and, uh, and uh, it's more difficult to protect by police. But when you have frequent buses and trolley buses, yes, the lanes should be separated, preserved, and controlled by police with enforcement. That means penalties come if somebody drives in. This is a busway built in uh, Miami, Florida. And in Canada, Canada is a city which, is, which was not quite enough, large enough for a uh, metro rail system. They built really a, an early type of BRT about 20 years ago. Very nicely designed. Uh, with many lines, very well used, and even coordinated with some land use development. They are, however, now reaching capacity in Center City, and they are now going to build a, to transfer, to uh, upgrade into light rail transit, because they need more capacity, and they will build a tun short tunnel in Center City, and then go to branches outside. This is also Ottawa in Canada. And then in uh, rapidly growing cities in developing countries, this is Sao Paulo. The, uh, the problem is first financing transit, but some of them are building metros very energetically, like Mexico, like Sao Paulo, but not soon enough. So in Sao Paulo, in spite of metro, they had several corridors which needed much higher capacity. And Sao Paulo was really the first one to completely reserve two lanes and have bypassing the stations and have buses and trolley buses. Uh, and so that, that was the first BRT, later followed by Curitiba, which is very well known, planned well with land uses and the bus system and uh, later Bogota and so on. This was in Lima, one of the bus uh, busways, and then this is the guided bus that was built, as I said, in three, four cities around the world. This is a BRT, which you see is rather simple, but it is protected, and therefore BRT is easier to enforce than just the bus lanes. Uh, this BRT, so-called Transmillennial in Bogota, has been designed very extensively uh, and it carries large volumes, uh, but it, uh, it is rather, you know, it's a fast and low cost quality, so these bridges are temporary, noisy uh, bridges and you have to go far out to get into the city the buses bypass each other at some places. This is in Istanbul. This is in Boston, a BRT, which was very poorly planned and it's very inefficient. It goes to a tunnel, which was very expensive, and the buses operate at very low speed because they don't have signals, they don't dare, they're not allowed to go around the curves to avoid collisions which with rail systems signals in short. Um, Boston shows that the BRT is not always cheaper uh, than, than rail, and that it, it, if it's not well planned, it's, uh, it's not a desirable system. Uh, trolley buses in some countries like Switzerland are in excellent shape, very attractive, very clean, 
uh, and, uh, and really very environmentally uh, oriented and, uh, and uh, uh, elements of livable cities. Switzerland also has a policy of using electricity because they have no oil at all and a lot of their railways are 100% electrified and their urban transit is electrified. This is one of BRTs in, uh, in Las Vegas in the United States. Now you see in Bogota, this is the Transmillennium and it provides good service, but it divides the city very extensively. This is in Bogota, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Curitiba, which is also considering changing to light rail on some of their routes. This is where you see how much higher capacity is on, on public transport than on the cars. These two buses carry more people than all these cars together. But this is the access to that BRT in, in uh, Bogota. Then they show that there's a problem that some, some people, especially those from Bogota, they like their system and it is a huge improvement over the disorganized transit they had. But they are now arguing around the world that this is the only mode that should exist. It's better than rail, cheaper than rail, even uh, better than metro and so on. They are very emotional about it. They present certain interests, but any extremist who is trying to tell you that one mode is the best is not a professional. Because there is no one best mode. And this they show to show how the high capacity it is. But this is actually prop code buses. This is not a good performing system. They're backing up, they're breaking down on the capacity. They have had problems in maintaining the roadways and also the exhaust. We have cleaner buses now, but still in many cases, buses are not as environmentally clean by any means as trolley buses. Trolley buses remain the quietest and cleaning, cleanest mode of, of transportation on the streets. Now we go to rail. Uh, with tramways on streets, congestion started and really there was a problem on narrow streets. Uh, the movement in 1950s and 60s was to start building modern cars, which are quiet, spacious, and so-called articulated cars, very long cars, over 30 meters. They are still here operating on right-of-way C, but then, wherever possible, they provided right-of-way B like this, you see, at very low cost. Then, when the line comes to Center City, they have no good way and they build a tunnel, but it's a short tunnel, as soon as possible, the line comes up. And it's the same, the same vehicles, oh, sorry, okay. but you see, this is the same train that was in the streets and on right away B and on right away A. So that's what light rail can do in different types of rights of way. United States stopped building any tramways in 1952. But in 1974, they noticed that, well, the whole world is developing this light rail and we are staying behind. So the movement started there. I was one of the organizers of the national conference of, on light rail in my city of Philadelphia and we really started at that time and since that time about 20 cities have built light rail. This was in San Diego and this is in St. Louis and this is in Portland, Oregon, the best planned city that we have that really integrates good streets, good transit, good pedestrians and, and bicycles. Portland, Oregon. Um, technology of light rail has greatly increased. 
you see it goes from rails which are in grass, so it's visually excellent and environmentally very pleasant. Um, the vehicles are very quiet, spacious, now there was low floor, there was great diversity of those vehicles and uh, in most cases their boarding and lighting is very fast so that they really um, uh, provide very high quality of service on the lines that are well planned. I should mention that there is a city of Bergen in Norway, Norway here. They opened up two years ago a brand new light rail line at a very moderate cost. It has many crossings, it has several tunnels, but every crossing has a signal that comes when the train comes. It performs beautifully and it's really excellent and well accepted by the riders. This is a typical long articulated vehicle. You see how spacious it is. And then in the last 30 years especially, it has been found that transit, that cities want to have more and more pedestrian streets, pedestrian areas, pedestrian zones where the whole area doesn't have any monorail traffic, any motorized traffic. But then transit has been brought right into those pedestrian areas. Buses in some cities, but they're not quite as uh, friendly with pedestrians. Pedestrians don't like buses in, in the street as much as light rail. Interestingly, in the beginning also people said, well, light rail and pedestrians, there will be collisions and so on. They found that it's very, very safe. Of course, the cars go those kilometer or two slower. They don't go 40 kilometers per hour, they go maybe 15, 20. But after that, they can go, some of them on the lines, 70 or 80 kilometers per hour. So light rail has become a central uh, element of reconstruction, reorganization of entire cities. Interestingly, Germans, Swiss, Austrians have, and Belgians have always had a lot of tramways which they upgraded into light rail. French never had modern tramways until 1970s. And then the Ministry of Transport said this is this mode should be considered because it is better than buses in many situations and, uh, and uh, a lower cost than the metro. So the French cities have many light rail systems and Swiss uh, and, uh, and Spanish cities also. This is in Vienna. You see this is very different than the vehicles that we used to have before the tramways. This is in Karlsruhe. And another element appeared so-called tram train. It's really not tram, it's light rail and train. It's in several cities have begun to build light rail compatible with railway. It's not only track gauge, that of course must be the same, but it is the powering, it's the uh, current type of current, signalization, braking, all of these elements. But Karlsruhe has opened up these lines going 30, 40 kilometers. And you, you are in center city, in this pedestrian area, you board the vehicle and it takes you from the city and it takes you to a remote suburb. It's been extremely good. This was a new line in Saarbrücken, which again is in the street in center city, but then it goes to railway and goes 40 kilometers from Germany to France, actually. So this is, this is one of the most successful systems in the cars where, where these cars are coming um, right into the shopping area. You can notice that all these cars are articulated long, high capacity. And now the comparison of this impact is that this fits much better pedestrian areas. Well, the BRT in this situation really divides the city. 
BRT then goes into center city of Bogota, it's a little bit more pedestrian friendly, but it's not quite as attractive as light rail. This is one of the new uh, light rail lines in Montpellier, in France, and uh, I haven't seen, but I understand that Nice and Marseille and Montpellier and so on rebuilt the entire center city, making it more pedestrian friendly, parking in some garages. Outside of that, coordinating cars and transit and pedestrians, but really giving, returning human character to the city. So looking at the technology of this mode, uh, we had, even up to 1950, Vienna had three small cars in a train. So there is a driver and three conductors. And then they began to build bigger vehicles. This is what you have, one vehicle or two vehicles coupled together. Then they began to build longer vehicles. And then they introduced the automatic fare collection, which eliminated the conductor. So as, as it went on, the capacity was this much, crew size, number of persons operating went down. So we even have in some cities in America, four of these articulated in one train, capacity up to 760 with one operator. So extremely uh, productivity of operators is now about 10 times of what it used to be. The fare collection is, however, important that it is automated and uh, it does not, it, it allows the people board and alight at up to 16 doors on a train. If we get to Moscow then, I, the, these turnstiles that you have, I have never seen them in the vehicle anywhere. And I think that they are, they probably increase the collected fares, but the decrease of speed you have, the reliability of service is incredible. So uh, that's, that's the problem. Um, so presently, light rail vehicles and, and trams, these are more urban, these are more regional and so on. There's a great diversity of them. And there are many new systems uh, around the world. Yeah. Over 100 cities have built new light rail systems in recent years. Um, where are your tramways? Their vehicles are concept of 1950s. So it's about, you know, since 1950s, uh, cities developed totally different vehicles than what you have. You have only single standard four axle vehicle. Their uh, fare collection is very inefficient, or inefficient because it slows down the traffic and it's inconvenient. And uh, then uh, I traveled yesterday and I see that you, instead of trying to get more right of way B, to improve the services, you use some right of way B to allow the cars to get in. So you degraded the mode from tramway to old inefficient tramway instead of raising it to light rail. So I hope that uh, with the change of administration and decision to buy new light rail vehicles and so on, that the entire system will be reviewed how it operates and made much more efficient. These are different models, and you see great diversity of vehicles. And in uh, Portland, Oregon, they built an excellent light rail system and then a local tramway line. And that became so popular that the development of housing is in that area very successful and expensive. And they call it Global Streetcar that's advertising 
that there is tramway there and you should live, live there because that's the most people-friendly area of, of Porto. Now what happens... Well, what happened in the United States was that there were many, many tramways in all cities, we call them streetcars. But then the campaign came pushed by lobby of highway builders, automobile manufacturers, oil companies, rubber tire companies. And the companies, transit companies were private. And they would come and buy the whole company. And then they would like to destroy all the tramways, all the cars. How did they do it? Well, propaganda was saying, that, that's a no future. That's a noisy old thing. The future is the automobile. So the comparison that is then given is that they take a, a tramway streetcar, which is 40, 50 years old, and compare with the most modern bus. Does that make sense? Why don't we take and compare modern light rail with a bus from 1950s? Probably because that one doesn't exist. It's already formed apart. So you have to be very careful. Your people are beginning to say, oh, tramways, or some people maybe say, tramways are old, future is, I don't know what. But uh, you have to really make professional comparison, compare up-to-date vehicle on one mode and the other mode. Uh, to compare these two modes is fairly long, and uh, I always, have written that way and insisted for my students that when they, whenever they compare, for example, metro and regional rail, or trolleybus and bus, or tramway and, and bus, and so on, give the advantages of one or the other, and give disadvantages. You have to measure one and the other set. So that's the proper comparison. I don't have time for that today, but I just want to show you an interesting study in the United States that there are two cities which, were very, which are very similar. Sacramento in California, which is the capital of California, and Columbus, which is capital of, of uh, Ohio. Both are about the same size, a like million people or so. Both have uh, state governments, both have universities, so a lot of similarities. Uh, uh, Columbus decided just to improve a few buses and so on, nothing drastic. Sacramento decided to build light rail, and within, within uh, 20 years or so, the uh, number of trips per person in in Columbus, Ohio, dropped down, and in Sacramento with light rail, it increased from 19.5 to 30. So you see, Sacramento now has much higher quality transit than, uh, uh, than Columbus. In general, our cities, which have built now light rail, have, several of them have mayors who are enthusiastic and go to other cities and talk about their experience. And they say, it's not what we improve to travel by trains. We change the whole city, the whole city. We coordinate it with modes. And we, they apply what we are arguing professionally, that we should have intermodal cities which coordinate different modes. We're not talking about Banning the automobile, and not talking about abandoning some modes and so on. We are combining which modes are the best together. And truly, if you think, if you plan a metro, you cannot plan an efficient metro without considering bus and trolley bus, all feeders and transfers and park and ride and so on. We have learned through decades that we have to plan different modes together. Above light rail, we go to 
um, automated systems. This is a so-called light rail rapid transit that is completely separated and fully automated. We have these automatic systems, so-called AGT, Automated Driveway Transit, either on rail or on rubber tires. Uh, on rubber tires, they are mostly in the airports. There are over 40 airports now which have these shuttles. And that technology works very well for that purpose. They're short trips, frequent, that's what we need in airports. The rail systems, though, the rail systems uh, exist in several cities, Copenhagen, uh, Vancouver, and so on. And they are also very efficient, somewhat larger than rubber tire. And uh, because they are automated, they run shorter and longer trains, depending on passengers. But they can operate every three minutes throughout the day because there is no cost of additional drivers. And that's the main uh, advantage of automated systems. By the way, some metro systems are now beginning to talk, or some of them have fully automated lines. Paris, very proud of their lines, Singapore, and there are about maybe some Chinese cities and so on. Unfortunately, uh, some of them did not use this chance to split the long trains into short ones and have very frequent service, which I think they're missing the main benefit. And I expect to have some discussions with colleagues in those cities why they did not foresee something like that. This is a rubber tired system in Lille, in France. It's very frequent. So they use this frequency very well. Uh, it has many riders. It, it, they made a mistake, they made too small vehicle. So it's very narrow inside, look at this. So that was a mistake uh, in, in the design of the body. It's not a system mistake at all. The doors and the platforms. These are at the airports. And this is one in Miami where we have Metro, and Metro could not go through Center City and have many stations, just physically, and the cost was extremely high. So they have Metro coming, and then this distribution system with automated cars distributes to about 20 stations. Really looks nice, very integrated in the city. See, this is the metro, and this is the automated system. Metro. Well, metro, this is one of the oldest from Hamburg, modernized. And then Montreal built metro in 1967, rebuilt the entire center city, and oriented it toward that metro. Uh, it's a very nice system, and it really changed the entire city, it made it much more livable. Um, where is this? San Francisco Bart, Bay Area Rapid Transit. When the entire United States were only talking about building highways, railways, and so on, San Francisco people stood up and said, yes, we need more for automobiles, we like, we will travel more and more. But we should not depend on highways only. We should provide a high quality public transportation that will be able to attract and serve people from the cars. They built the BART system, which has really changed the entire Bay Area. We travel through that Bay Area quite nicely. That system brought many, many innovations and in it's world renowned. Its maximum speed is 130 kilometers per hour. In the city, we have also had shorter services to uh, in business district. Munich. Munich is famous from its entire transportation planning that it coordinated, and even before 
we adopted this name of um, intermodal coordinated planning. They were doing it. And they had many railways from one side of the city and many rail lines from the other. They built a tunnel through Center City. And then S-Bahn, they connected and, and electrified and it, its ridership went from 150 to 600,000. Today, about 40 years later, it's about 800,000 and really serves the entire region. And in many ways, transportation people go to Munich to see how to operate good transit. And city planners are going to Munich to see what the livable city is. They have truly coordinated transportation. They have some highways, high capacity in Center City. They discouraged parking in Center City. They have central area which was congested street. They have completely closed it and made it open for pedestrians. Uh, this is one of many, many, many modern trains in Japan which are uh, nearly the same in some cities for the metro and for regional rail. But their efficiency is, is remarkable. By the way, I should mention that your Moscow Metro is remarkable also and it's world renowned by the rapid travel, well organized, minimum headway between, between trains and so on. Very, very high capacity. And you really, without that metro, you, you couldn't have Moscow as it is now. So, and Metro is being planned and being extended. And I expect to discuss some with the uh, city Metro people. Uh, I think that uh, you should change from very deep stations to shallow stations and several other things. And similar things in St. Petersburg also. But Metro remains the backbone of your city as it is in most Japanese cities. This is the S-Bahn in Munich. I'm adding now some of the not common modes of transportation. Uh, if some of you have been in touch with transportation, you may have heard so-called PRT, Personal Rapid Transit. That is being proposed to many mayors, to many city planners, this is the future, it's all automated by computers. You get into a vehicle, you push the button, and it drives you wherever you want in the whole network, in the whole city, without stopping. So it looks like a perfect idea. Actually, that has been proposed more than 40 years ago, and from time to time, again and again, does it work anywhere? It works between about three points in the parking lot of the London airport. And that is also extremely inefficient. Why? Because the concept is totally illogical. It doesn't sound... Uh, if, if you have a busy area like Center City, you will not have not the best of small vehicles. They will be smaller than cars. And if you have lower volumes, like in suburbs, you wouldn't have money to build all those expensive structures, nor would you like to have expensive structures. I'm mentioning this just because there are groups of people going from city to city and sometimes find some planners or mayors and so on who start believing this and they delay the plan. But PRT is, a, uh, I describe it as a test how to cross a centipede with a, with a sow, with a female uh, uh, swine, in order to get 100 hands. It doesn't work. It just does not work with the system. So this is what's running in the order suggested for London and so on. This is in London. Monorails are mentioned in many cities and built in some cities. They mechanically can work, but in vast majority of cases, they're less efficient than rail vehicles. And uh, it's believed that because it's above, it's acceptable. It's not very much different than if you would build an elevated rail line. 
so it has a limited uh, application. This is a historic one in Wuppertal, and then many of them in Japan, and one or two now in Sao Paulo is building one, one in a Korean city, and everybody whom I saw in that city is scandalized that they are building this funny thing here. But uh, so, from place to place there are monorails. Oh yeah, you have one fairly funny monorail, yes, yes, yes. This is suspended monorail, which means its beam is even higher because the train goes here. This one has been over it in suspense. The others have under it, so it's smaller between <laughs> So that is a this is my review of modes of transit with emphasis on these so-called medium capacity. And I'm, I'm again repeating that I think your city is correct in building more metros and plans to use more regional rail, but you must not neglect this medium capacity because you cannot have only metro and buses. You need something between those and a lot of modernization is needed. Uh, as you see, you are in a tramway and some of these operational concepts way behind. And it's not only a matter to buy vehicles, you really have to understand the whole system with its operations, coordination with other modes and so on. So that's the uh, situation and uh, I think this will give you at least the transit side where the world goes and where you are and what you should be uh, following in the coming years. So, thank you, and I'll, I'm open for the questions. Так, вопросы. Ну, пока просто руки поднимаем, куда дойду, туда буду давать микрофон. А потом там посередине еще будет кто-нибудь с микрофоном ходить. Далеко более, поближе кто-нибудь. Поднимите, что такое? Нету? Ну ладно, пойду. Мистер Бучик? Mr. Wojcik, I'd like to ask a uh, question. Uh, if uh, we consider dif different ways of uh, 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 of uh, realizing of transport in some area, for example, uh, Leninsk Avenue, just for example, to make highway or to make a uh, uh, railway system or to make uh, I don't know pedestrian area, uh, how could we? Uh, measure and collect uh, different factors, you know, there are some economic factors that can, can be uh, easily measured, some social, uh, some uh, secondary, uh, secondary effects and so on. How are these problems uh, usually uh, solved? How, how could we collect all these factors and make just one, one decision? Which, av which avenue did you mention as example? Which avenue did you mention as uh, For example, Lenin scaling you. Uh, there are, I guess, dozens of uh, different ways how could we, how we can transform this area. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, in, in some cases, it is, if it's a very concentrated activities area or residential area and so on, it's rather clear. But in other cases, you have a um, you have a problem how to how important is the transportation and vehicular transportation and how much is social life and other functions. You then come to the question really, what kind of area and what kind of city you want to have, and uh, you just. Any, any area that you're planning should be a part of the planning of the whole region, right? And then in each area you have to decide what is important to what, to what degree. 
um, uh, you, uh, it's, it's in many cases very clear that uh, uh, even in small towns, you have a street which is continually congested and there are more than many people. And if you have 5,000 people there in, in, in two hours and uh, 200 cars congested, then obviously that's not what should be there. And in many cases, elimination of cars. By the way, usually the businesses are against that. But when you manage to make it pedestrian area, they support it greatly because their businesses usually improve. It doesn't mean you should make pedestrian areas everywhere, of course. You know, so you have to judge really relative weights of that. I think you run in Moscow here in many streets, many avenues. You know, should you really maximize the flow of automobiles or should you uh, make sure that the area is residential and therefore pleasant and you have some schools and you have medical centers and so on. So you just have to uh, uh, consider the various elements in the light of the goal, what the goal is for the entire city and for the adjacent neighborhoods. Вопросы можно вопросы можно задавать по русски и здесь есть прямой перевод в наушники. Есть ли, да? Есть перевод. Так, сейчас. Мистер Овчик, скажите, если удалить турникеты из общественного транспорта, какие есть способы контроля безбилетных пассажиров? In in the West, well, in uh, most uh, industrialized, developed countries, uh, many modes of transportation have so-called self-service or proof of payment, where passenger must pay and carries the proof of that payment, and there is a control from time to time, and penalty is given if they do not get it. Uh, that is um, extremely well operated in many countries of Western Europe. In some others it is not, but uh, uh, in most other countries you would have uh, various types of, of uh, payment and control coming from time to time. What did you have in the, in the Soviet Union? You had a, a self-service system. People were paying and sh even showing how that they paid and so on. So uh, it, it, it really depends. Uh, uh, there are, again, many advantages and disadvantages to any system that you have. But, uh, and therefore, if you have flat fare, that means one fare regardless of distance, then it's easy, you can control people once when they enter the vehicle or get out of the vehicle. If you have graduated fare, different, different distances, then you have different payments, and that becomes, you have to check them twice. But technology has solved even that. In Singapore, on the bus, you come with an automated card, you scan it, and the card then you think, well, you can scan for a short distance and then ride long distance. Well, you cannot because you paid the maximum fare. So when you're getting off, you again scan and it returns the money to you. So then there's no way of beating the system. So you see, technology does help in many ways. But the variety of types of fare collection uh, exists and depends on the tradition and on the, uh, on the introduction. Uh, I, I was talking for 20 years before we introduced the first proof of payment in the United States. And they were telling me that, oh, by constitution of the United States, you couldn't check anybody. Nonsense, of course. We, when we introduced light rail or articulated buses, it's impossible to operate those if you handle one by one person. So 
you you cannot use the system that really slows down the whole service because your task is to have incentives to use transit. How will you have incentives if you have slow boarding, irregular services, congested streets and all? So you have to consider the pro-transit policies at all steps that you're doing in transportation, in street design, area design, and transit system operation. Так, дальше. А вот в конце нет желающих, там у нас тоже микрофон есть. О, да, вот, вот там человек руку поднимает, поднесите, пожалуйста. О, там, да, стоя, вот, вот сзади. Будем по очереди. Добрый вечер, мистер Вучик. У меня такой вопрос, может быть, не совсем связан с темой, но наболевший уже давно для российского общества. В недавнем времени были введены скоростные поезда, планы там Сапсан, ну их так все называют. Но проект достаточно неудачный, и многие люди на тех маршрутах, которые проходит этот электропоезд, выражают крайне свое недовольство и вплоть до того, что бьют стекла, там, ну и различные какие-то моменты, которые... Так, сейчас секундочку, тут есть проблема с переводом. Проблема с переводом. Говорите, что они на английском. Так, кто умеет на английском говорить? Саш, ты умеешь? Пеке, док. Придется заново вопрос задать. Yes, Hello. Good morning, Mr. Wuchik. Это все, что я знаю по-английски, поэтому вопрос дубль два. В России недавно вели скоростные поезда. Все они их знают, так называемые сапсаны, на некоторых направлениях, но они заменили так называемые поезда дальнего следования. Одно из их преимуществ то, что они скоростные, но многие люди, по направлению которым, которых эти поезда двигаются, выражают огромное недовольство, вплоть до э, биения стекол, когда двигаются эти поезда. И, ну, короче говоря, они очень сильно этим недовольны. Как вы считаете, с чем это связано, какая основная проблема? Э, вроде как двигаются в положительном направлении, но то ли не успели изменить систему, то ли какие-то проблемы могут быть еще. Как вы считаете? Спасибо. That, that is a problem very often when you build something new. Uh, but uh, I know there were protests sometimes in France against it, and, uh, and uh, some in California and so on. Um, you have to work carefully on planning and listen to the opinions of affected people. Some people, and this is a historic problem for economists, if you build on a small road at the river, you build a bridge, and there is a restaurant there. At once, restaurant gets 10 times more customers. So there is great benefit. On the other side, there is some cost. You really have to consider and negotiate and so on. And sometimes you do have to override. Uh, therefore, most governments have so-called uh, eminent domain. That means the government has the right to take over property. But you should make sure again that the government compensates rather than just takes it away. Um, we had we had a case in uh, uh, Stanford University, famous Stanford University, which in the beginning, yes, we want high-speed rail in California. Then they began, oh, there will be too much parking, too much, I mean, really small things. And the faculty of Stanford had a special session to decide how sharply they should attack the entire project. And they would get a station for high-speed rail going from, Los Angeles, from San Francisco to San Diego in walking distance of Stanford University. Well, in that case, I consider that very short-sighted 
And if they would call me, I would, I would argue on the side of the train line, not for Stanford University. So you have to distinguish what are the arguments, and sometimes you do have, oh, even committees formed and decision and so on. They've had uh, recently a huge national debate in Stuttgart about rebuilding the entire station. And it was a uh, counselor, she got involved and founded the committee to resolve this. So I have no direct answer except that you do the best you can and, uh, and then uh, when necessary and if the project is of national significance and this is a local problem, you have to solve the local problem and you have to have some uh, eminent domain, some legal rights to do that. Да, дальше я единственное хочу попросить, вот э, профессор Вучик не знаком со всеми проблемами и трудностями, которые есть в российском транспорте, поэтому если вот подобный вопрос задается, то лучше и отметить, какие именно есть проблемы в той системе, о которой вы спрашиваете. Так, теперь близко, вот тут. А, мистер Вучик, я знаю, что вы знакомы с проблемой маршрута Колумбии. А маршрутки — это, с одной стороны, проблема, но, с другой стороны, в Москве, я думаю, многие меня поддержат, но практически нет выхода для горожан, которые живут далеко от метро. Им неудобно добираться просто на автобусах, потому что автобусы очень немобильны. И что вы предлагаете нам, как специалист, чем заменить маршрутки? Спасибо. Yes, jitneys and taxis and so on have a certain role, and especially if it is some role that public transport cannot economically serve, then you allow them, you regulate and allow it. What, what I'm critical of is that if you have no regulation, then these jitneys come, and that's historic, that happened in, in California 80 years ago that people with taxis came in to the streetcar stations and took all the passengers just before the streetcar came. And then they took the most of the riders and uh, then went home. Well, the streetcar had to operate for public service. You cannot allow uncontrolled competition. You can have coordinated services. So that uh, this is a uh, this is the trend also in, uh, in Western Europe and many other countries, that you do have competition, but it is controlled by a coordinating body. It's not an uh, unregulated competition. They, therefore, transit in Great Britain really suffered from their deregulation. But in many other countries, they increased efficiency but they did not destroy the system. In Britain, they destroyed the system because they prohibited buses to be coordinated. So we all professionals are scandalized if we work on a coordinated system. Why are we for coordinating system? Because that's for passengers. I mean, we have to, first, all transit is not made to make money for somebody. It's primarily to serve us. And then, of course, made it the most efficient way economically. But you cannot forget the public just to cut the cost. Because then, if we were for that, then we should first start closing all operas and libraries and, and schools. Save a lot of money. Так, дальше теперь там вот кто-нибудь в конце, вот там. В конце где кто-то с микрофоном? А, вот, ну вот да, давайте. Здравствуйте, уважаемый мистер Вучик, спасибо вам большое за интересный рассказ. Вот вы сказали, что для того, чтобы пересадить людей из личного транспорта на общественный, нужно дестимулировать пользователей автотранспорта. Но все вот присутствующие в зале, да и вы, наверное, понимаете, да, что в Москве людей не пугают не многокилометровые пробки постоянные, не поборы государственной автоинспекции не страшны погодные условия. Ну и много еще разных других причин. Как по-вашему, какие э, методы дестимуляции 
автотранспорт будут актуальны в Москве. The beginnings are easy. You cannot have free unlimited parking in most of the city of size of Moscow. St. Petersburg, downtown, if you can catch up space, you can park for 12 hours. Well, why are we subsidizing? That's a subsidy. You have to analyze really socially what is where the cost goes. And we are saying uh, this is a public street, it should be free and so on. Well, it should not be free. You cannot, you cannot provide all free rides and subsidize that road. We're talking that metro and buses are subsidized. We're not talking how heavily our automobiles subsidize. And studies are showing that the, the costs of automobile travel are very high. That first of all, we, when we drive, it costs us only 15% what is direct cost for one travel, it's usually parking and so on, and a little bit of gasoline. 85% we already paid for the automobile and insurance and all that. But in addition to our cost, we involve cost on all the others. Even taking only people who are driving, the, the, uh, every person who drives imposes slight delay on all the others. And at 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, that doesn't matter. There are not many people. But in the peak hour, in Verskaya, it's becoming heavy. Then you add a few more cars, the whole thing collapses. And the cost that, we, that I impose on the others who are driving, and they on me, is enormous. We are not aware of that, and we don't pay. You know, this is, a, this is something that is not immediately understood, but now we have been analyzing that for decades. And economists and, and, and we engineers understand that much better. And um, the tax on gasoline, for example, is, um, is very high in Western Europe, in most countries. It is not only to collect the money, it is to increase this direct cost of driving. Because the problem is, the direct cost of driving is very low, that makes it very attractive for us to, to drive as much as we can. But the cost that we impose is totally ignored, and that cost of congestion so goes on the entire society. Now through gasoline and some other costs, and now the road pricing in some areas makes you aware of that total cost. And then I believe that in some years we will be using more so-called road user price, road user uh, uh, payments. Uh, Singapore introduced that and is charging depending how the traffic is. If the traffic is congested, they increase the, the payments, so fewer people drive. If the traffic is fast, they decrease, because you can travel without congestion. So they say, we're using this charging to keep the traffic going, not to collect, not to penalize anything, but you also make it for all who want to drive much more comfortable. In London, you pay a lot to drive into the center city, but you can drive and park better than you could before. And there are more people on transit, better transit services. And there are benefits on all sides. Так, дальше. Should we rebuild some again? Uh, should we rebuild again some tramway lines that were used during the existence of the USSR and now are demolished? Some. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
again, you know, don't quote me. Dr. Butchik said that we should build more tramways. <laughs> well, we should build more tramways, more trolling buses, better buses. We should, but we should really, uh, uh, as I showed you, we, we do neglect it, especially this mode that I talked today. Because really, if you think how you travel today by a trolley bus or, or a tramway or a bus, is it as good as it was 20 years ago? No, it's much slower. And the trolley bus, which is congested on Tverskaya, is empty because who will leave the car to sit instead of his car? He sits in the trolley bus and nobody moves. I mean, you are in a terrible situation. So you really have to, and, and tramway in your, in your situation has, in many areas, separate ways or ways that can be made separately. You can introduce that the car tramway comes and gets a green signal and goes. I've seen scandalous situations on the streets that the cars are all let go and tramway is waiting forever. And it has right away B like left turn lanes and so on. I mean, total lack of control, total lack of understanding of so-called policy transit first. What is transit first? Transit first says the purpose of our travel, either by car or by bicycle or by train, is that we get from here to there. <coughs> so what transportation should we favor? <coughs> the transportation, the vehicle that carries 1.2 persons, or, per, or one that carries 40 persons, like trolley bus, or 160 persons, like tramway. So, so this lack of any advantage for public transport is uh, you're way behind. Doesn't make any sense. And really, just ask yourself, 20 years ago, well, for you it's difficult, 20 years ago you were small kids. But, but, but ask your parents. It was fast to travel by transit, it was good. Now, travel by transit is in many cases, not very efficient. And you, you should encourage it. Because again, we, we all at a high level, we all agree experts, there should be favoring transit over cars. But are we doing that? The way you, I see your, your trolley buses and tramways and so on, you have to do a lot to do that. Uh. Вот, э, если можно, я задам вопрос, потому что я, я так вот в этой теме. Э, мы ведь профессора Вучика последние два дня возили по Москве на разных видах общественного транспорта, водили его пешком по значит, перестроенным нашим улицам, которые перестроили в скоростные магистрали, э, значит, в том числе там, через всякие лужи на троллейбусах, э, трамваях и и так далее. И вот э, довольно много удалось поездить, только электричку мы не успели охватить пока, но еще посмотрим. Я вот хотел узнать, как э, впечатление ваше от э, каждого вида э, транспорта, в котором мы побывали, и от пешеходной инфраструктуры города. I haven't said anything yet. Um, I, I hope that you have passed a low point. But when I, when I was here a few years ago, and in Tverskaya, I had to climb over automobiles to walk on the sidewalk. That was horrible. Um, I understand that there are discussions, and your Department of Transportation is very active and doing many new things. So I think that you are turning in the right direction now. Um, for pedestrians, um, generally you do have sidewalks and so on. Uh, you know, in the United States we have cities which have no sidewalks. We, uh, we went through 40 years of eliminating pedestrians. It's horrible. Now California is making studies how to 
help the children can walk to their schools because it's too dangerous. And because it's too dangerous, because there's no walkway, then of course mom or pop have to drive and they add more to traffic, so it becomes more dangerous, right? So we have huge problems. You had, and it's in my book also shown how you used to park on pedestrian crossings and so on. Now it, it is getting slowly better. Um, on, uh, I know that you tried some bus lanes but had many problems and those problems are expected. Bus lanes are not so easy to, uh, to change. Uh, I do not see any innovations yet, although there is a commitment to buy more tramways. So I think that is very positive. Uh, the results will come later, but I'm, I'm I will try to draw attention that it's not only buying different cars, which are still the same, four axle cars, short cars, and, and, um, and going one way only, light rail usually change to make it two way, and so on. Um, the, the rest of it, um, it's just a very difficult situation until, until you take something more drastic. And you have to introduce the concept of, of uh, signals, giving priority of special turns, special, and around metro stations, the Usli and all that. Some of them are very good. Some of them are extremely long walking to get from the metro to the to the bus or train and so on. So it's uh, I have hopes that it's getting better, but it still uh, has a long way. Скажите, а существует в мире какой-то удачный опыт внедрения общественного транспорта на воде? И для Санкт-Петербурга применим ли такой общественный транспорт? Yes, in some cities, uh, well, in some cities, in Venice, of course, public transport is by boat. <laughs> There is in Vancouver, where there is a big island with many people, and they go by boat across. In some cities, there is very important. In New York, we have Staten Island, very important fare. Um, in, uh, uh, so in, in many cities which have physical conditions, uh, those uh, ferries are used. Uh, I am. Yes, I traveled in St. Petersburg once, a long distance from, uh, uh, what is it, uh, this summer palace into the city. The long ride was by boat and so on. So I'm sure St. Petersburg can, can use it. I'm not sure that your Moscow could be that. And plus the, the weather in winter for a long time was not so good. But it is a potential in cities which, uh, which have the conditions for that, yes. Mr. Vuchuk, thank you for your visit to Moscow. I'm in some way your colleague. I'm a magician. I finished the Moscow Automobile Automobile Institute for the specialty of the Automobile Automobile. Вот. У меня к вам вопрос, ну, вот. э, значит, э, такой вот. Э, Мадия. А, у меня к вам вот такой вопрос. Если вот вы знаете, что ну, Москва представляет собой э, разрозненные районы, которые разделены железной дорогой, через которую ну, существует не так много путепроводов. Путепроводы эти узкие, соответственно, если попасть, чтобы мне попасть из одного района в другой район, там, мне необходимо там проехать, ну, сделать большой перепробег на автомобиле. 
а, вот каким, на ваш взгляд, каким образом возможно решить проблему вот, железных дорог, которые находятся на поверхности, через которые как бы просто так не переедешь? Вот, на ваш взгляд, каким образом возможно решить? Um, if you have a busy line where there are many trains, then you have minimum number of crossings or you, you build underpasses and overpasses. Um, if it's not very frequently used, then it may be some with some warnings that people can cross. Now you're talking about crossing by automobile, right? And uh, it's again, if, it's a, if there is a big demand to cross and great inconvenience to cross, then I think you should consider the building an underpass or overpass. Uh, you do not want to increase the number of crossings. Uh, and again, some rail lines may not be used but some that are not used can be very valuable for opening new lines. You will need also more railway lines. So it depends on the situation, on the conditions, and, uh, and uh, on the traffic situation, how many cars will be crossing. But if you, have, if you need many, many kilometers around and back, then an economic analysis would be made if you reduce so and so many vehicle kilometers, how much would, you, would it take to build an underpass? Okay? Depends on the case. Мистер Очи, как вы относитесь вообще к тому проекту, который организует Максим Кац и городские проекты по приглашению вас, Жан Куазива и других экспертов, попытки помочь решить некоторые проблемы в Москве? If I disagreed with that, you would not have heard this lecture today, right? Uh, uh, it is uh, it is often done so, especially if there are different opinions or there is something new being planned and so on to to call uh, a committee of experts from the outside. Uh, so that is, that is not new, and it's uh, usually done bringing neutral people. Once I was called to Edmonton in Canada, there was such a dispute that they didn't want other Canadian experts. They called a gentleman from England, one from Germany, and myself from the States. And we gave them advice, and they decided was where to build the light rail line, and how to handle some bridges and so on. So, uh, I think uh, that uh, such, uh, that practice does happen and uh, it can be useful and I'll do my best to, to prove that if I can. Good evening, Professor. Thank you very much for the lecture. And uh, in the very beginning of the lecture, you said uh, there is a normal uh, variant. There is 20 or 30 percent of uh, people who decided already to use public transport or private transport, and uh, the decision is not might not because of the transport situation, but because of some side effects. And uh, the vast majority of people, they, they are not, not decided and uh, we, should, uh, uh, we should improve the transport situation to let them use the public transport. So the question is, 
uh, is it true that uh, the best crowd concentration in the city is when all this 60-70% of uh, citizens use public transport and if not, when, where is the optimum and how could we evaluate the public situation in the city to, to find uh, which person is the, the, the best? Thank you. Um. Well, first of all, we all, we professionals agree that uh, uh, if we allow all modes in, in a reasonable way and allow some trips which are most efficiently done by such and such mode, that that's a most efficient system. We want, for example, many people traveling 15 kilometers into center city Moscow or out of center city Moscow uh, that is certainly most desirable by train if you're going shopping and so on you can go more by by your private car if you have a baby you go by private car we want to allow you that and uh, so an optimum system will have integrated modes what percentage is really depends on, on many, many conditions. One is the size of the city. The, the larger is the city, the higher is the percent, should be the percentage of transit ridership. Uh, I claim flatly in my book that you cannot have a city with more than a million people which is designed as automobile dependent that is livable. So many people drive, and we have more congestion in cities which build all kinds of highways than we have in those where we build a few highways and coordinate. Detroit is one example of a huge city, totally concrete and auto-oriented, which is falling apart economically, socially, in every respect. It's really collapsing the city. So, it depends on the age of population, on customs and so on. Uh, in in, um, in uh, many European countries, uh, elderly, for example, use transit extensively because that's, uh, that's more desirable. I was sometimes critical of people in the States who are only thinking how can we make it that people in their 90s keep driving automobiles. Well, that is really not understanding even the society. First of all, persons over 90s should be carefully checked whether they can drive for their benefit and for the benefit of the society. So, but in, in deciding on, on the policies of these auto disincentives and transit incentives, you decide also what kind of city you have. If it's an uh, industrial city uh, and uh, livability is not that important, it's a different setup than in a, in a tourist place where you want really to have greenery, to have amusement, to have children, to have elderly, and so on. So it depends, but uh, there is not one model of the city that everybody wants. It's not that uh, Zurich is the best or Las Vegas is the best or whatever you want. Uh, it really is somewhat a function of what the local people want. We try to inform them though. I think our duty is to tell people, if you want, do you want this kind of city or this kind of city? If you want this kind of city, we would give you this kind of composition of transportation. If you want this one, we'll give you a different other one. So they should be aware of that. But I still remember 20 years ago when I went to Rome very often, Rome was totally chaotic. And, and I was I tried to write in the newspapers that this city was designed for pedestrians 2,000 years ago. And it's a, it's, a, it's a museum of the world. But the Italians, Romans, behave 
drive everywhere at all times and park in any way and so on. You want to live like in Los Angeles and live in Rome. That just does not go. Well, there was not that much attention they didn't even publish my thing at all. But it's interesting also that in many situations, we were talking these things and not many people listened. There is then sometimes maturing. There is change of societies in some ways. There is certainly very strong awareness of livability and sustainability and um, what is what is livability? Uh, we, uh, we design design uh, define livability as uh, a city that is economically vi uh, uh, viable and sound, socially with good relations, not excessive problems and a lot of income distribution and so on, and environmentally sound. And then if we take that through the time, that's what we call sustainability, right? We are trying to make city livable now as soon as we can and keep it livable, that's sustainability. Well, environment, word of environment, we didn't even know until about 1960. Sustainability was not done. Now we are becoming aware of that. In Western Europe, the awareness about this quality of life is extremely high. In Switzerland, they give a transit pass a very low rate or reduced rate. If you sign that you will try to use transit whenever convenient, nobody can force you, nobody will control you. But it makes you aware that you are contributing to your environmentally pleasant Basel or Zuri or Luzerne. And we notice now in the United States that your generation, the 20s, 30s now, are driving less per capita. We're still wondering why and how, but there are many, many more young people who either take bicycles or who come back to the city, to live in the city. There is some change. So I want to prepare you as you get into professions and you're frustrated, you know, many experiences in life uh, become uh, more and more disappointing as you go along. But don't be. You still, with the time, you notice the differences. And, and uh, uh, when I was mentioning light rail in the United States, they said, oh, that's nice for Europe, but that doesn't work all the here. Self-service, oh, yes, that's, that's there. And I said, you mean uh, all Europeans uh, are stealing much less than we are? And what are you talking about? The changes do come. Changes toward public transportation has been going, and all these policies have been changing. You should now use this crisis that you have, that you come with the solutions, and, uh, and that you propose. And if the arguments on your side, then you have to press for it, and you will notice. I mean, would somebody thought that have thought that 25 years ago we would have an entire airport without smoking? Buildings, huge areas, no smoke. So we can change, but we should not be discouraged if it takes a long time. We just have to keep working on it hard, and the and the changes will come. Um, actually, you mentioned many, many cities today, but there is uh, one unfortunate difference between these cities in Moscow. This is the average yearly temperature. And uh, we probably all heard many, many times the argument that uh, pushing people to use public transport is sometimes even cruel because, like, in winter we have temperatures like 
minus 25 or something like this. And there are no more cities big like Moscow which are that old. So uh, what would you suggest to answer to this argument against public transport? Well, that really has both sides. I argue that uh, uh, yes, if you have your car, you get into a warm car and so on, and you drive, it's very pleasant. But I would certainly not drive on, on, a, on a day with icy road when I'm just listening where are accidents all over Philadelphia. So, you know, I, I get to my train, it's a little bit longer walking. Then I'm warm and absolutely safe and much better than, than the road. Uh, transit agency should uh, look how to uh, and how to protect you more in different weather, either in the summer in the south or in winter in the north. Montreal built uh, so many underground passes because they have very 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 icy weather. Winter. Um, so transit agencies should do that and uh, should should announce that and should show. Very often transit agencies publish how much it costs you to drive your car, the total cost per year, and how much it would cost you in transit. And many people are surprised because they have never thought about how much it costs them on the car side. So, so the same way. Uh, with the with the uh, weather, you just have to fight it, and uh, uh, each side has to um, uh, get prepared and weather reports even and uh, protection waiting and reliable schedule, reliable service is very important because there are sometimes trains that go every 45 minutes. And there's nobody there until three minutes before the train comes. Because it's exactly so everybody knows. So all those things play a role. Uh, Mr. Vucic. Uh, Mr. Vucic, as far as I know, you have met uh, uh, quite a few authorities from the Moscow government. And, uh, uh, but uh, there is uh, uh, an issue that uh, the uh, ideas and projects that they promote are, uh, uh, are often quite contrary uh, to what uh, you say. So uh, they uh, often suggest uh, that uh, we uh, widen the roads and remove uh, the rails and uh, 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 the question is, what uh, uh, does it exactly be? Uh, so, uh, is that that they do not uh, have uh, the proper knowledge, or, or they uh, deliberately ignore the uh, uh, situation and uh, uh, neglect the public opinion? Thank you. Uh, it is not quite that simple, and uh, I must say that uh, when I was here the first time in about nine years ago, it didn't seem to me that many people, if any, understood the whole complex picture. Um, then my, God, my book got translated and I met many people who said that they read my book and, uh, and they agree with me. And I hope I, I pushed a little bit in that direction. But I cannot expect that uh, everybody in the government will change at once. But I do, uh, I, I do uh, uh, have talked to many people who are uh, thinking very broadly about problems. Now, 